was Luke chapter 2, but I guess for a couple reasons, uh, especially because I think the pastor just covered this in a lot of detail and service, I didn't want to go through that again. But the other part was is that of all the times that we've studied Luke, a lot of times we, we skip right over the second half of chapter 1. And so I just wanted to kind of dive a little bit deeper into looking at uh, these, these passages, and these particularly these songs. We'll see the songs of, of three different individuals. We'll see the song of, of Elizabeth, the song of Mary, also called the Magnificat, and the song of Zachariah, also called the Benedictus. And uh, I'd never studied them before, and so I wasn't really sure exactly what I would see there. I wasn't really sure what the theme would be uh, with this. But there's, there's several things that I want us to kind of, as we walk through the scriptures, we'll kind of just just see how this goes here. But there's things that I saw about Mary. There's things that I saw ultimately uh, about God that are being highlighted again and again in these things. I want to kind of bring this out. But as I started thinking of what theme to, to use for this, I guess this is what kind of jumped out, worthy of praise. So that's really what the lesson is going to be about, is talking about God being worthy of praise, because that's really what we're going to see here. In these songs, they, they all have a common theme. It's a celebration of God, a celebration of, of different characters, characteristics about him, attributes, but also his purposes and also his activity and so forth. So I'd like us to, to kind of, as we walk through that, to look for that. So what I'm going to try to do is we hit each section. I'm going to, I'm going to see if I can kind of pause and maybe write down a few things that you see that we see that uh, God is worthy of praise on, what they are specifically highlighting. And I guess my hope is that as we're about to enter into Christmas coming up next week, and we are celebrating the birth of Christ, just as they're looking forward to the birth of Christ, and they're celebrating uh, God, that we would also join them in prayer and thanksgiving. So that's kind of where we're going with this. Um, we'll see how it goes. Like I said, without a safety net, but we'll just get, get rocking here. So. Um, if I can get a volunteer, we have a lot of scripture to cover today. Uh, and I appreciate um, uh, volunteers to read through the scriptures here. Um, but let's go ahead and start with uh, kind of the beginning. And I backed up slightly to verse 38, just to give us a running start into this. But that's where we stopped last week, was in verse 38, uh, when Archangel uh, Gabriel had come to Mary and delivered uh, this message. And we see a response there in verse 38. We'll start there. But if I can get a volunteer to read from verse 38 to 45, and we'll talk about that a little bit. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. Uh, at that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea. Uh, when she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. For why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. So it starts there, I did a running start because in verse 38, and, and there are just several characteristics we, we see about Mary, and I think I mentioned last week just how amazed I am at her response to this. And, and in all honesty, it feels to me the way she responds to God's <gasps> calling on her life, his purpose uh, for her life, is just puts even Moses to shame. Remember when we talked about Moses, when, when God came to, to Moses, and, and Moses started arguing with God. You know, he gave all these excuses, 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 finally ending with, send somebody else. He didn't want to do that. And we see in Mary just the exact opposite. She asked for some clarification about what, what it means, you know, what he means uh, um, about that she would be, be with, with child, with the, with the uh, Messiah. Um, and and then, then from there, she just answers, two things, two little phrases that speak so much about Mary. It says, I am the Lord's servant. So she had submitted completely to God's will for her life. And then secondly, she answered, may it be to me as you have said. It means she's eagerly desiring to do the will of God. She's eagerly desiring to serve God. And that's where we left that in verse 38. And then we get to verse 39. So what does she do right after that? So she says this to the angel. The angel departs and then she does something here. What do we see her doing? There in verse 39. She goes to Elizabeth's house. Yeah, she goes to her relative's house because the angel mentioned to her that her cousin, her relative older cousin, Elizabeth, 
the one who was said to be barren, the one who was said uh, unable to conceive, is now has a child. It is actually six months pregnant. And that was a sign that Gabriel, uh, Gabriel had given to Mary. And so she goes into the hill country that lived in you know, near Judea, and that's the course of uh, kind of our map view. We're going from Nazareth, which is to the north, and they're going down towards uh, towards uh, Jerusalem and the province of, of Judea. And uh, so she heads down there. Maybe it's a few days' journey. I'm not sure how long it takes. But the thought is that immediately she turns and she goes there. Now, right now, at this point, she's completely alone, right? The, the angel had given her this message. She hasn't told anybody about it. It was in a private. But she wanted to see this great thing that was, was done, that, that the angel spoke of uh, to her cousin Elizabeth. And so she goes down to, uh, to this town. And it says there in verse 40 that she enters Zechariah's home and greets Elizabeth then uh, it gets pretty amazing. And then uh, what happens there in verse, uh, verses 41 through 43? How does Elizabeth respond to Mary's greeting? So she comes in and she says hi, and then what happens? The baby leaps in her womb. The baby leaps in her womb, yeah. So she's six months pregnant, the baby leaps in her womb, and apparently it's a very unusual leap. I mean, we know that babies move around in the womb, but this is a little different. Um, uh, in fact, she describes that uh, in, uh, uh, in verse 44 as that as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. So there's something different about this um, uh, here. And then she says something to Mary. So Mary comes in with a greeting. We know Zechariah is mute. He, was, he had, because of his disbelief, the archangel Gabriel had struck him with, with he cannot speak. So he can't say anything, but Elizabeth goes ahead and speaks. And she says a few things to Mary here in verses 41 through 43. First of all, she says in a loud voice, this is a proclamation, a declaration here. She says here, blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of your womb, which I find interesting. And then she goes ahead and she, and remember these are cousins, these are relatives, right? Um, and then look at what, what she says, what she says next here. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? She, Elizabeth has some unusual insight uh, here, and we know this because, which makes sense because it says there in verse 41, she was filled with the Holy Spirit. Right. Right. Now what was amazing here was, to me, was uh, a, couple, a couple things. Well, one is that what she said, but, but I was thinking about this, you know, this isn't a time of uh, cell phones and emails and letters and that kind of thing, where you can go ahead and tell somebody information and then go, Mary had said that uh, and, and not given any of this information to anyone. She just walks across the threshold, says hello, and immediately you hear Elizabeth kind of echoing the same words of Gabriel back to her. Blessed are you among women. We talked about that last week. She's blessed. She's favored by God even more so than Eve, who's mother of all the living. Uh, she is now the mother of the Savior. And she says, blessed is the fruit of your womb. Now, uh, in a, in a few days, <laughs> I don't think Mary's showing much of uh, being pregnant, you know, with that piece. So again, the Holy Spirit is telling her, uh, telling Elizabeth that she is with child. Uh, it's not something that's obvious. It's not something that Mary would have said to anyone. It's not anything anyone would expect. And yet here, Elizabeth knows. And of course, because God is, is here uh, speaking through her. And then she talks about that she is unworthy really even to be in Mary's presence. And, and certainly she is uh, praising the, the God for the honor that he gives to Mary, but really what she's praising is the child. He says, I'm unworthy to be in the presence of my Lord. And, and again, this is kind of like, who are, who are you, Mary, to come to me? And it's like, well, I'm your relative. Well, she's, she is seeing uh, Mary in a very different light here. Um, and so I imagine here at this point that, that Mary was greatly encouraged that Mary's faith was even strengthened here. You know, things that no one else could have known about, she knew about And uh, uh, here. And so we see this, this response. The other thing that kind of jumped out at me, leapt out at me, in verse uh, 44, talking about that the baby leapt with joy. Now, what do we know about John? We talked a little bit about this last week. Well, John is also a miraculous birth here, and a miraculous conception, I should say. Uh, because and he had a purpose. Remember what the angel said his purpose was to be. What was that? Do you remember? He was going to prepare the way. To prepare the way. 
And this is an answer to a prophecy in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, which talks about preparing the way of the Lord. So he's, he's coming six months, uh, or uh, about, about six months, uh, um, or I guess, yeah, six months ahead, ahead of uh, Jesus, and he would be uh, preparing the way for, for the ministry of Jesus, preparing the way, preparing people's hearts to return back to God. He was to be a herald of the King of Kings. And it's just kind of interesting here that he's, he's in the womb, and even here he's heralding the king. This is his first, uh, uh, first time that, that he heralds the king of kings. Uh, the first encounter. The, first in, the very first encounter, but it's in the womb that he does so. And that's just pretty, pretty amazing uh, here. Um, so we see this kind of miraculous kinds of events. And I guess the things that, that I wanted to bring out here was certainly the encouragement to Mary, strengthening her faith. But the other thing is, is that, you know, Mary, sometimes we forget about, about this aspect. At this time, Mary's very much alone. She's a young teenager, teenage girl. She's poor. The, God gives her this amazing message, and she goes to her relatives here, and now she realizes that God is also working in their life in sort of a similar way, this miraculous conception. And Elizabeth can be a support for her. I just kind of thought about that too, that not only were, were her words striking her faith, but we'll see there that, that Mary's going to stay with Elizabeth for three months. But she, but God also gave her a support system through Elizabeth, someone who understood her and could stand by her with that time. And, and I think about that a lot of times when we're called to do things of God. You know, sometimes it, it is the burden is on our shoulders, but how often God provides people with us to comfort us or walk with us through it, or at least encourage us. And here she had that Elizabeth uh, with this. So, some, some uh, uh, interesting uh, things that I saw here. The last thing I kind of want to mention here is about Mary's faith. And take a look there at verse 45. The last thing that Elizabeth declares here is, Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. Now, if you remember back with Zechariah, when, when the angel Gabriel gives this amazing message and promise to Zechariah, his response was, Well, how will I know this? Give me a sign. And the angel said, okay, I'm going to give you a sign. You're not going to be able to speak for, <laughs> for, for, for nine months until this comes to pass. <laughs> and, uh, but Mary didn't ask for a sign, but God gave her a sign anyway. And the sign here was that Elizabeth, the one who was said to be barren, is, is, uh, is pregnant here. And so she went to see Elizabeth um, uh, here, and then she hadn't even really been able to even see Elizabeth and already get this declaration back that says that uh, praising her for her faith in God. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that Mary didn't go to see Elizabeth in order to get faith, in order to strengthen her faith, but because of her faith, she went to go see the sign. She wasn't requiring a sign, she already believed God, and so she's being praised here, unlike Zachariah, she's being praised here because she believed that God fulfills his promises, that God is faithful to his promises. And so Elizabeth is praising Mary for her faith here. And so again, I'm just, you know, we, we talk about that there was nothing that Mary did to deserve this honor. It's grace, it's pure grace here. But yet at the same time, God chose incredibly well. We'll see a little bit more about Mary uh, as we go on uh, and get to, to Mary's, Mary's song next. Um, Okay, so in keeping with the idea of worthy of praise here, we see Elizabeth offered up many things of praise, and it's really centered around God uh, here. What are some things that you saw of, of that she praised God for? First of all, it says in the first word, blessed among women are you, so she... she praised God for, for Mary. Okay. And she praised God for the fruit of her womb, which would have been Jesus. Okay. And she praised God for um, Mary coming to see her. So how does it happen to me that, that the mother of my Lord would come to me? Blessed is the child of Mary. Yeah, blessed is the child of Mary. You see a couple things here. I wrote it a little differently than I said, but God's undeserved favor. You know, undeserved favor with the visit that was made to Elizabeth, but also God's undeserved favor because Mary was blessed, and she would be called for generations to come, blessed, uh, most blessed um, uh, of women. 
because of what God has done for her. God has, has exalted the humble. And Elizabeth praises her for her faith. Blessed is she who believed that there would be fulfillment of what had been spoken yeah. by the Lord. And you know, as I thought about that, that particular verse, is it just Mary who's blessed when, when uh, you believe what God God has promised? But really all of us are blessed. All the, uh, the world, all the, all the human beings is blessed by her. Yeah, we are blessed by her and through yeah, her. By she and is saying uh, yes to the Lord, you know, we got that blessing. Yeah. If she's not saying, uh uh, no, it's not working, what's going to happen? I know God got another another idea, another plan, but Yeah, so we're we're blessed through through yes. her. Yeah. Um, but also I, I think there's a message here about any everyone is blessed if we would take God at his word and trust in his promises. Uh, and, and that piece, and so there's several things that are worthy worthy of praise, and we'll we'll get more into how you know this fulfillment of promises. But there's a few things uh, here that that are specifically pointed out um, that uh, uh, that are that show how God is worthy worthy of praise. All right, well, let's go ahead and move into uh, Mary's song, and I've got a few more verses written up here. We'll we'll try to see uh, try to do a good job with uh, kind of time management here. Um, you know, at first reading, it's kind of interesting. I guess I was must confess. A lot of times I read through these songs, and, I, and back in the Old Testament, we see like the song of Moses and other things. And you kind of read these songs, and you're thinking, well, you know, yes, they're happy, they're celebrating, uh, but there probably isn't really much there. You know, it's just a celebration. Okay, got it. Moving on. Well, it, one of the things that really humbled me is as I started looking at this, is just how rich it is. These every every word every phrase is incredibly rich so we'll kind of I'll kind of go through that you have a little handful of scriptures here that maybe will help make that point but let's go ahead and read through this so if someone could read uh, for us verses 46 through 55 the, the Magnificat and Mary said my soul exalts the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior for he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave for behold from this time on all generations will count me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name and his mercy is upon generation after generation for those who fear him he has done mighty deeds with his arm he has scattered those who are proud in the thoughts of their heart he has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble he has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty handed he has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. So here we have, you know, Elizabeth makes this declaration in a loud voice, and then in return, Mary goes ahead and makes makes this uh, this pronouncement, really this song uh, here. And uh, we're going to kind of walk walk through this this piece. And uh, different commentaries are read. They talk about, uh, you know, that there are some parallels here between Hannah's uh, prayer and her response when God gave her a son. Of course, Samuel. That's in 1 Samuel chapter 2. But one of the things that uh, uh, also came out is that, is that Mary is weaving in here just all kinds of allusions to, to Old Testament prophecies, the law, the Psalms, just different, different areas just woven throughout this. And that's something I just didn't fully appreciate, really, uh, until we kind of started looking looking into this this piece and the point being is that you know again This is speaking of Mary. She had memorized an incredible amount of scripture Because she is pulling that out here and I, I only have time to go through a few things But she is basically in very shorthand almost I kind of viewed it a little bit It's like when Jesus was on the cross and he made these made various utterances referring back to entire chapters in, in that piece in a similar way, kind of a shorthand way, she's referring back to various scriptures. And you go back and you look to find those scriptures, and you'll see the context. And it'll give you additional depth to what to what she's saying. I hope to kind of bring that out here. Um, so again, something we should emulate is the memorization of scripture. Certainly, it was important uh, important to Mary, and, and God uh, brought that together here. 
Um, the first thing you notice there, verse 46 and 47, and this is really, Mary is saying the same thing. Uh, this is, this is uh, I guess, a kind of uh, a poetry, uh, a Hebrew poetry, where they do kind of this parallel thoughts, and so they, they basically are, are synonymous with one another. But she says, my soul glorifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Now we're going to focus on that last piece here in just a second. But the point being here is that you know, we had talked uh, many weeks uh, back uh, in, our, in our study of Isaiah that talked about you know, worship that God accepts. We talked about that the worship that God accepts is that worship that's sincere and from the heart. Well, here, when she's saying, my soul, my spirit rejoices, she's saying that, that basically this is welling up from her entire being, the depths of her being is welling up, and she's just speaking in, in praise. That's what's coming coming out. That's the sincerity of it. It's, it's, it's therefore, it's praise that God accepts. And she's giving, giving God praise uh, for, for who he is. And, and then specific things here are mentioned in a moment. And Psalm 103 speaks of this. Psalm 103 verse 1 says, Praise the Lord of my soul. All my inmost being praise his holy name. And that's what she is doing here with all of her being. Now verse 47, what kind of caught my attention there was in the end, it says, And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And I don't want to belabor this point too much. Did get, we did bring up last week, it talked about you know, the Catholic belief that, that uh, Mary was sinless and so forth. Well, this is one, there's many reasons why uh, you can argue against that, but, but this is certainly one of them. And it says right here in verse 47, she's declaring that God my Savior. Yep. You know, there. And to me, it's one of the clearest things. Now, I have read some, uh, some different commentaries that say, well, of course, in the scripture, Savior could be used in different ways. It could be just I mean rescue. And maybe, and certainly here she talks about kind of being rescued, maybe from rescued from humiliation or rescued from obscurity, or you know, it could be some kind of a calamity of some kind, and kind of using sort of a lesser sense of Savior as opposed to the ultimate sense of Savior, being saved from the consequence of our sin. So I started looking at that, I was like, well, okay. Um, is there any other evidence here in the scriptures that would help us to understand how she is using uh, using this term? Now, of course, we know that the, that that God had told Mary that she was going to be carrying the Son of the Most High. So we knew we talked about that that He would be divine. The Messiah is divine. We know that we know that she was to give Him the name Jesus, which means what? God saves, or the Lord saves. So, so there is certainly some other reasons to think that Savior is being this, this ultimate meaning. But this is where, just kind of go a little bit deeper uh, deeper into this. As I, as I looked at some of these phrases, if you take a look at these two passages, Isaiah 61, verse 10, and Psalm 111, verse 9, I can go ahead and read, uh, read these to you. You see that Mary's words are strongly parallel in these passages. Then when you go back to those passages and you look at the context of them, you can see they're very clearly talking about salvation, redemption. Let me go ahead and read these uh, for you. So Isaiah chapter 61 verse 10 says this, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. Does that sound familiar to what Mary was just saying? Uh, it goes on, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. And of course we know that's how we are saved, where, where, where the righteousness of Jesus Christ is imputed to us, is given to us, credited to our account. And that's what's being described here in this very verse, very similar words to what Mary says. And then in Psalm 111 verse 9, um, uses the same phrase, and it's the only place that I found where this phrase is used. She says there, holy is his name. Certainly many, many places talk about God being holy. And the thrice holy God, holy, holy, holy. But holy is his name. There's only one place where that's used, and that's in Psalm 111, 9. Well, if you go back to there, here's the context. He, he being God, provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. Is pointing towards eternal salvation. So I'm looking at, at this context. Again, it's a little bit deeper. It's not right on the surface. You're looking back at these other scriptures, but to me it indicates... No, she's praising God that her child would be her Savior. And she's praising God for being her Savior. And also, in uh, the first, uh, when, when the first miracle takes place on the wedding place, she said, listen to him. Oh, yeah, with the, uh, uh, the miracle of the, the yeah. changing the water and, into and wine. Yeah. She, she makes it clear she can't do nothing without him. 
she's, she's lifting him up. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, and then kind of going forward here, then verses 49 through 50, she goes on to highlight three characteristics of God. She says, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. You already mentioned that. And then his mercy, three different things that she brings out. And so, uh, speaking of God's uh, uh, characteristics, mighty one, he has done great things for me. He's talking about his almighty power. God is, is omnipotent. There's nothing he can't do. He controls all power. You can think about creation just by the sound of his voice, the power of his voice to command. All of creation can come into existence. It was the same way by which Mary conceived of the Holy Spirit. It was by the power of creation that God used uh, in Mary's womb. Almighty God. Then talks about holy is his name. And, you know, we as, as sinful creatures really struggle with holiness. And I know I can't do it justice in a few, few moments here. But holy is, is really referring to, to set apart. It's, 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 a, it's a holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, other, completely different. He's set apart. God is set apart from us in every conceivable way. Certainly his power, I already mentioned that, but also his love, his wisdom, his graciousness. Um, every uh, characteristic or attribute you can think of, he is set apart from, from us. He's, he's different from us and higher uh, than us. And so she's praising him, saying holy is a, is a sort of a sum uh, of his character, how he's identified. And then it talks about his mercy. And we'll hit this more when we get to Zechariah's song. But he talks about the mercy that he has in store for those who, who fear him. And this isn't a tremble before him kind of thing, but rather it's a reverence for him. Okay, you trust in him. God shows mercy and compassion. And Zechariah will hit this in a little more, uh, a little bit more here in a moment. Psalm 103, verse 17 says, But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. And that's what she's praising God for these various characteristics. But I also think, though, that, that all that's true, but it's also pointing forward. The mercy she's talking about here isn't just the mercy that God has shown Israel in the past, maybe the mercy of rescue from, from enemies and, and distress. When you think about all the history of Israel, but rather the, the ultimate mercy that God is doing by sending the Messiah into the world to secure salvation for his people and, um, and an eternal righteousness uh, for his people. Um, Matthew Henry commentary, I, I like what, what uh, he said here. He says, he described, this is a mercy that forgives, heals, accepts, and crowns from generation to generation. So anyway, one of my favorite comments. And then she talks about verses 51 through 53, his mighty deeds and so forth. But he talks about kind of a mix of not only his deeds, but also his justice in other aspects. Talks about things like scattering uh, the proud, knowing their inmost thoughts. He brings down rulers from their, their thrones. He lifts up the humble. He's talking about his, his providence, his divine providence. That's where That providence is where God governs and sustains his creation. And he's actively involved in his creation. He doesn't just, didn't just wind up the universe and walk away and let it go. No, he's actively involved in, uh, in creation. In fact, we know that in Hebrews 1.3, it talks about how God, um, God sustains uh, uh, the world and how he is at work. Um, and then Mary praises God's mighty deeds of justice and compassion. It shows here one of the things you see there is he filled the hungry with good things. And also talks about, again, his, his judgment, where the rich, not just being the wealthy, but really is referring to those who exploit others. Uh, so you think of the rulers that are using their power, abusing it to oppress the people. Uh, that's what's being referred to here. It talks about how, how he brings them low. Uh, he empties them and fills, fills the hungry uh, poor. Um, and so we see these great acts. I think about the scattering. I think about scattering of people. I started thinking about like with the Tower of Babel. Remember that where all the people came together. We're going to build this great tower. You know, honor ourselves, exalt ourselves. And because of that pride, God went ahead and scattered them. And that's kind of, maybe that's a picture here. Or it talks about toppling the nations that exalted themselves. Well, in Jeremiah 49, it talks about Edom. You know, they, they built themselves on high. And he's talking about like pulling them down in that verse. So you think of Egypt. You know, the superpower of Egypt and how he humbled humbled them. And then I also thought about this, these very same thoughts that she's pointing here are also pointing forward to what Jesus would speak to, because didn't he speak to, to these things as well? John chapter 7, verse 37 through 38. 
On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. In Luke 14, 11, Jesus said, For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Again, I just see not only speaking of what God has done, but also pointing forward to, to what Jesus would do, what Jesus would say uh, to his ministry. And then in verses 54 through 55, she starts to focus now back on the covenant promises of God. And he talks about him remembering, him remembering the covenant. Now this is something that we, we kind of don't really understand. We go from the Old Testament of, you know, do the New Testament. We don't realize there's 400 years of silence between here. We don't think about the fact that, that there's been no one on the throne of David for 400 years. We don't think about what it would be like for a people that says, you know, I've established the throne of David forever, and yet there hasn't been a Davidic king for 400 years, and they're sitting there oppressed by, you know, by the Romans. You know, what they're thinking, that God has forgotten us. That's, that was what was going on in that day, and yet there was hope. There was hope. There was talk of the Messiah. There was hope in the Messiah, but... But that was sort of the, the attitude uh, that was here. But here she's praising God for faithfulness to his covenant promises. And speaking of all this as being a fulfillment of the promise, specifically the, the covenant, uh, the Abrahamic covenant. It talks about to Abraham as a sense forever. I don't have time to kind of go through this, but take a look at Galatians chapter 3, uh, verses 6 and following, that, that speak specifically to that covenant promise. Um, I'll read one verse in here that talks about that particular covenant promise. So Mary is looking, looking back at this covenant promise and is praising God that he is fulfilling it. But that promise, however, wasn't really fully understood by everyone. Most of them thought it was just for the Jews. Many of the Jews thought that, well, if we're Jewish, we're saved and all that. We'll talk about reality uh, of how people are saved. It's the same way in the Old Testament and New Testament. But, but Mary didn't have a complete understanding of that, but we get that com more complete understanding in Galatians. And one of the things that we see there, Galatians 3.16, it talks about this, uh, this promise given to Abraham and his descendants and his seed. Here's what Paul says there in Galatians 3, verse 16. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. And then in the rest of Galatians, it talks about justification by faith. Uh, that was the gospel, or that was the message of salvation given to Abraham, that the Gentiles, too, were included and could be saved as well. Uh, anyway, again, I'm just trying to point out that there's a pointing forward, not just, not just backward, about what God has done. The other thing that I saw in here, if you look at, uh, this came up many times, was Psalm 98, verses 1 through 3, is that there's so many of what she says uh, gets repeated again in the Psalm 98. Um, here, I'll go ahead and read this to you and just kind of listen for some, some parallels here. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. We saw a lot in this text about his strong arm and talking about his arm. Well, here we see his holy arm has worked salvation for him. Verse 2, the Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. We saw that in here, I think, through a lot of the judgment and, and things that are being spoken of, and also lifting up the humble. Verse 3, he has remembered his love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Again, we see, you know, Mary's words, you know, pointing back to this, but every time you look at these scriptures, they're all talking about that context of salvation there. Um, not, it wasn't obvious to me until you start digging into these, these other scriptures. Now, certainly, Mary's praising God for his goodness, for his faithfulness, for what he has done specifically for her. You know, that she's undeserving of the great honor that's bestowed to her. She's thanking God for that. But again, I think it's pointing forward to God's greatest act of mercy, that of, of securing salvation for his people through Jesus. So what do you see here worthy of praise? There's probably a lot here, but we'll see if we can capture it in the time we have. Um, what are some things you see where, where that she's praising God for? single thing. 
Well, for his gracious, um, you know, even noticing her, it says, for he is regarded as a humble state of the fallen slave. People in this time for everybody will call me blessed, and they do, you know. Ugh. Talks about being mindful of her, watching over his people. We see this, this again, God's undeserved favor uh, with that, praising God for what he's done for her. She's, she's, you know, she says, I'm nobody, that you even see me. You know, the rest of the world doesn't see me. I'm an outcast. I'm, but yet God sees her and, and lifted, lifted her up. We talked a lot about this. I'll just throw it up here since that's probably the most obvious one, is that God saves. We talk about God as Savior, that God is the one who saves his people. And he takes the initiative. He takes the action. And she's praising uh, uh, him for that. You also see things about his, his done great things for me. So, again, nothing, nothing up here is going to be radical. But God is good. And he expresses, he, he does good things. He's a compassionate God. He has mercy, right? God is merciful. And he's compassionate. Um, God is a God of justice. He's a God of holiness. He judges the nations. He controls the nations. God is in control. I'll be honest, this is probably the one of the main things I had to keep getting reminded of today because there's a lot going on in our, in our nation, much less the world, that makes us kind of nervous about what the future looks like. But it's a reminder that God is in control, whether the king is a good king or a wicked king or the people are against him or not, it doesn't matter. He is in control. He is sovereign. And, and Mary is praising him for this and for his purpose and plan. It talks about that God fulfills his promises. And that's what's meant by remembering. He remembers his promise. He takes action on them. He's so unlike us. We forget what we even promised. And then a lot of times it's a toss-up whether or not it's actually going to be done. Not so with God. You can trust him. Even though it was 400 years later, when God says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. He's faithful to it. And so Mary is praising him uh, for that. We talked about his attributes. He's, he's almighty. He is, he is holy. So we see all this praise. And again, the reason I'm making this list is because we see that as she's now looking forward to the birth of Christ, uh, we are celebrating in the past the birth of Christ, but in both cases, praising the God who sent us the Messiah. That's what I want us to do, is to direct us to that same spirit of, thanks, of thanksgiving. Yes, sir. It's just amazing when you think about how purposeful God was in this whole process. He didn't take any chances of letting a human deliver these messages. He had yeah. Gabriel speak directly yeah. to Mary and speak directly to Elizabeth. He had the angels appear directly to the shepherds and this is just you know the most incredible event in the universe and, right and, and, and the timing was just perfect this, this is the time of the roman empire with yeah roads everywhere where people could probably travel there's more of a common language right then than there was in quite a while yeah, just yeah that's right perfectly timed where the word could go out and uh, in the fullness of time it's, 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 right. exactly. it's like the perfect moment yeah. perfect time. and he orchestrated that through his power and his wisdom and his right. and his will yeah and yet we forget that he's in charge of what's going on right oh, now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was maybe this is now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It was a lot easier back then. And now we've got, yeah, that's, that's very, very true. So we see, we see this, this, this piece. Well, I want to, if you'll bear with me a little bit, I'll, I'll go on for a while. I know if you all, I think the service is at 10. Yeah, we have time. Art's back. Awesome. We have lots of time. Uh, that, that piece. You know, there was a rehearsal piece. Now, now we're getting to the tough stuff. The art's back. You know, we have to. Um, <laughs> But yeah, let's go ahead and, and I want to want to kind of summarize the next part, which is the birth of John the Baptist. But then I really want to spend the rest of our time on uh, the Benedictus. So let me go ahead and read for you verses 56 um, through 66 uh, here. So we take a break uh, from this at verse 50, 56. It says Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Uh, so Mary was when John was born. What's that? You think she was there when? I'm thinking that's why. I don't know why she would wait and then leave 
just before it, you know, with that piece. It's not, it doesn't say that, but the timing is there that, that I think we can safely assume that she was there. So. Yeah, I, I would think it'd be kind of a strange time to just, I don't know, unless, unless all the rest of the family's there and she just wanted to go, I don't know. To me, it would seem like if you waited that long, you'd be there to, to see that happen and then move on. So that's, that's my thought, although this, the text doesn't specifically tell us that, but I think she was there for it. Yeah, good question. Um, and so it says, Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months, then returned home. So again, probably uh, stayed there, certainly for the, uh, for the uh, birth of John the Baptist. And then verse 57, when it was time for Elizabeth to have a baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. They said to her, there is no one among your relatives who has that name. Uh, a little argument there, a little family squabble. Uh, then they made signs to his father, or to settle this, to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, Zechariah asked for a writing tablet. To everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately his mouth was open and his tongue was loosed and he began to speak, praising God. The neighbors were all filled with awe. And throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. Well, there are some, some interesting uh, things here. Um, we, we remember that Elizabeth initially, when she got the news, she went into seclusion. She kind of hid herself away. I don't, it says at least for five months. I don't know if, if it's kind of like once this child was born, that's when the rest of the neighbors were, were brought into this. I don't know. But certainly we see the, the case that, that when John is born, the people come rejoice with her. And I just remember there in Romans uh, chapter 12, verse 15, it talks about rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn, how we're supposed to come together and support one another. And here you see the people doing that for Elizabeth. Now, there is that argument over the naming of the child. Now, I think probably, you know, to their credit, they're probably saying, hey, you know, remember, Zechariah is really old. It's probably the only child he's ever going to have. Why don't we honor him by calling him that name, you know, calling him after his father, call, call the child Zechariah. And the mother says, no, his name is John. And they're like, well, no one in your family has been named, named that. By the way, John means, means gracious. But so they go in and ask the dad, and so he can't speak, but he writes it out. His name is John. Very, very uh, direct, very decisively, very firmly, his name is John. To against what the crowd uh, was, was looking for. And it says immediately his mouth was open. You remember this is a fulfillment of that prophecy that was given back, all the way back in verse 20, where the angel told them that this is the sign that this you will be unable to speak until all this has come to pass. Well, this is the point at which, uh, at which uh, it come to pass. And I want to say, too, that we saw, you know, back in verse 20, it was probably the lowest point or seeing Zechariah's worst moment, okay? The scripture center was very clear about, about, about who we are in that piece. He had unbelief then, but here he shows great belief. Uh, God had showed him that he had fulfilled those promises, so, so Zechariah is believing all the rest of God's promises that he has for this child. And he says his name is is John. I'm going to name him John. I'm going to obey the word of God. And here he obeys the word of God and then God opens his mouth. One thing that's also kind of interesting is that when Zechariah was in the temple, not to go back too far, but one of the things when the priest would give the offering of incense and the prayer, after they were done, they were to go back out and they were to give a word of benediction to the crowd. But you remember, Zechariah was struck mute. So when he went out to the crowd, he just kind of fumbling around and people were like, what's going on? And they kind of assumed he had a vision. Well, he was silent for nine months. But now the first time that Zechariah can speak, he gives the benediction. That's what's recorded there in the next few verses called the Benedictus. So let's go ahead and, and jump into that and read these words of praise that he gave to all the people that were gathered there. Someone can read, uh, it's a long swath, but uh, verses uh, 67 through 79, and we'll kind of close, close on this. And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David his servant, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from old. So 
salvation from our enemies and from the hands hand of all who hate us, to show mercy toward our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to Abraham our father to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of his enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go to, on before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, with which the sunrise from on high shall visit us, to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child continued to grow and to become strong in spirit, and he lived in the desert till the day of his public appearance in Jerusalem. Thank you. So here we see that the Holy Spirit fills Zechariah, and he speaks these words of, of praise, but also prophecy says here about what um, and really most of what he sings about here is not his own son who was just born but rather is praising and speaking of the Messiah um, uh, who his son would herald um, so he, he begins uh, here and he talks about this visitation of God and this was something that I'm going to say was kind of a bit of a two edged sword the people were dreaming of the day when God would come in, in, the, in the sense of that he would come, it would be, a, a, you know, the basically they would rescue them from the hands of their enemies. They would receive this, this redemption as a people. And it would be a time of great blessing. But there was another side of the day of vegetation, of, of visitation, that, that caused them to have some concern. It's because in different prophecies, such as, such as in, uh, uh, in Amos, and then I also gave you one here in Malachi chapter 4, uh, verse 1 through 3, it talks about that when, when God returns, that for some, it wouldn't be this day of redemption. For others, it was a day of judgment. And the picture here of this visitation is kind of like uh, back then when a general would do a surprise inspection of the troops. You know, come on a day unexpected, and you look at them. If they're ready, if they had done everything they were supposed to have been doing and everything, then he was going to give them a reward. But if they were lazy, negligent, and, uh, and ill-prepared, there would be judgment. There would be punishment. And so there was kind of, you know, the day of the Lord was kind of viewed in sort of these two different ways. But here Zechariah um, emphasizes uh, the blessing that comes, the redemption of his people. But I do want us to remember there is another side to this. In John chapter 1, verse 12, it talks about the blessing. Yet to all who have received him, talking about the Messiah, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And then in John chapter 13, verse 18, it says this, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. That's Jesus speaking there. So it's this two-edged sword. The day that the Lord visits us, for some was a day of blessing, for others uh, it was a day of calamity. Um, and so he talks about this day of visitation where, where God comes to his people. And then he talks about the way of salvation made uh, uh, made for his people through the Messiah. And I'm kind of running out of time here, but I would like to, to kind of cover this a little bit, looking at this verse 60, uh, verse 69 and uh, through 71. It talks about he has raised up a horn as salvation for us in the house of the servant David. And not, not to go too deep into this, but to understand that this is a reference back to these different covenants. It actually goes back a little bit even before the covenant that God had made with David, but actually all the way back to goes back to Jacob in Genesis chapter chapter 48. And it talks about, sorry, Genesis chapter 49, uh, where he talks about Jacob gives a blessing to Judah, saying that it was through the line of Judah that this eternal king would come. But then in 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, God comes to David and tells him it's that of the tribe of Judah, that eternal king will come from the, from David's line. That's kind of interesting. Here it talks about the house of David and, and that whole context was David wanted to build God a house. Wanted to build him a temple. And that would be given to, to, to Solomon. And God says, no, you're not going to build me a house. I'm going to build you a house, David. But what he meant was I'm going to build you a dynasty. A line of kings. And from that line of kings, from your descendants, the Messiah would come. Again, that was 400 years earlier when the last of the Davidic kings was on the throne. Um, and so, um, you know, during this, this time, there's a lot of reasons people could have forgotten about 
about him. But in Amos chapter 9, verse 11 through 12, God helps answer uh, that fear they had, um, that, that God had forgotten them, or that somehow you know, his promises failed. In Amos chapter 9, verse 11 through 12, God says, In that day I will restore David's fallen tent. I will repair its broken places, restore its ruins, and build it as it used to be, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. He's talking about that after the, that exile, when that last king, or, or during the exile, when that last king had reigned in Jerusalem, and then they brought it back from the exile, but they never had a king again. They were still oppressed by other nations. That there would be a day where God restores that line. And so the people were looking forward to that day as Amos uh, prophesied. And today was that day. It says that he has raised up a horn of salvation. Now we don't talk that way, a horn of salvation. But, but we do say things sort of similar to this. So a horn of salvation is referred to a horn is like referred to the beasts that fight with horns. Okay, that was, that was, their, that was their weapon. So it's a sign of their strength. We might say they're strong, as strong as an ox or something like that. Well here it's talking about the horn. And it's a horn of salvation. I mean, it's a horn that's able to rescue, that's able to deliver, that's able to, to overcome anything else. It's unmatched. And that would come from the house of David. That was the line of David where the Messiah would come. And by the way, verse 70, this has all been said to you through the scriptures. Yes, sir. Just curious if the uh, reference to a horn of salvation could not so much just the, the strength of that, but like in Revelation, you know, they're these beasts could show up and they have horns that appear yes. that represent kingdoms yes, yes. and powers. Did the horn here also be representing Christ's kingdom? That's excellent. It does. It represents a strong king. Yeah, more specific. Not just strength, but a strong king. Really the king of kings, the eternal king, the Messiah. Yeah, excellent. Excellent point, yeah. The horn, is, that's, a, that's a better, uh, uh, closer meaning uh, to this. Excellent. Um, and so the, he said that this was said through the Holy Prophets long ago. This is something that they should have known, should have recognized, and they should have trusted in. And he says that to provide salvation from our en enemies there in verse 71, from the hand of all who hate us. Now we know that the, the Jews thought that Jesus was going to come, okay, you're the Messiah, you're of that, that Davidic line, go ahead and kick out all the Romans, and let's go back to what we had when we had the line of Davidic kings. But of course, they were disappointed because that wasn't what he was going to do. Well, the enemies is referring to here is really the ultimate enemy. And we have several ultimate enemies. The ultimate enemy would be the devil. If you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, uh, verse 15, and if you skip ahead to the end in Revelation chapter 20, you see that that ultimate enemy, the serpent, the devil, that there's a prophecy that's made against him about that this son of the seed of, of Eve. Again, it was kind of a pointing to the virgin birth even back there in Genesis chapter 3, that that Messiah would crush the head of the serpent, whereas the serpent will only bruise Jesus' uh, or the Messiah's heel, talks about there. Well, this horn of salvation was going to crush their enemies, but it wasn't the enemies they thought of. It was actually the enemy, the devil, and all, that, all of his minions that come with him, including death and pain. Suffering, all these things would be cast away. That's why I point to Revelation chapter 20, verse 14, when death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire, and, and uh, of course the devil is also uh, thrown into the lake of fire. So it's talking about about this, and so he's praising God for what uh, for what uh, he is going to do through this Messiah, and again showing mercy to our fathers, remembering his promise and the oath, the sacred oath that he swore on himself. To fill. Um, and then what are we saved from? Well, certainly from our enemies, that's one thing, but in reality, I remember I told you it was a two edged sword. Really, what salvation is from, it isn't from the devil, but rather it's from being saved from the wrath of God. It's because of the consequence of our sin, we, we are deserving of eternal damnation uh, and eternity in hell, separated from God. That's what we're, that's, that's the bad news. Uh, um, that we are all under. The Jews didn't understand that. They thought they had a free pass because we're descendants, physical descendants of Abraham. Well, Paul, again, is in Galatians chapter 3, makes it very, very clear. No, it's those who have faith in Christ that are saved. It doesn't have to do with your race. It doesn't have to do with your pedigree, who you came from, who was in your line. No, it's all by faith because Abraham is saved by faith. Um, and so we need salvation and we need rescuing from sin. 
jumping down to verse uh, verse 77 it speaks to that to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins the Jews didn't get this and the disciples didn't understand this the disciples didn't understand what the Messiah's purpose was is to secure that way to provide atonement for their sin it talks about there all the way down in verse 79 to guide our feet into the path of peace we don't tend to think of the fact that we're rebels against God we're at war with God that his wrath is upon all those who are still in rebellion against him because he is a holy God well Jesus is the Prince of Peace he brings peace he atones for the sin and he, he brings the two together in peace so we see the gospel being given right there in this we don't have to wait for Galatians you know come to come afterwards but even before Christ's birth we see weaving all of these the Old Testament scriptures together to give us a clearer understanding them a clearer understanding that salvation is through faith that their real enemy was their sin and they needed they needed uh, that to be dealt with and that's what the Messiah was going to come to do that was his purpose I mentioned this because I've heard some people say well there was a different you know you look at the Old Testament God New Testament God and they're different all there's no difference God is unchanging his plan hasn't changed he's just working out his plan the plan of salvation wasn't different for the Old Testament versus the New Testament it was always the same saved by faith it was always the same issue uh, that was being dealt with and so he goes ahead and praises and, and I'm out of time but but you see him praising for that salvation praising God for his mercy it wasn't deserved it wasn't that they did good works to earn salvation no it's through God's tender mercy and that light that would come and would guide them God would give them that revelation and give them that that opportunity uh, to have faith in him and so you see this huge song of praise well like I said I'm out of time and I had I had I knew I had about three lessons here so um, anyway it was a great study for me and I didn't really know how to divide it up so we've got it all um,